Right. Uh, well, I grew up in Los Angeles. Uh, my family loved music very much, and they all played instruments. My grandfather, who was a dentist, played the violin. My uncle played, I don't know, seven or eight different instruments. And uh, my mother also studied the piano when she was very young. And um, music was just part of our household. And um, I had to study an instrument. I started with the violin, uh, but that didn't go so well. I just remember our German shepherd, every time I opened the lid of the case, would run under the table and sort of do this. You know. So that was sort of providence speaking, I think. And then I switched to clarinet, and I, I enjoyed it. I, I think what I really loved about the piano is that I could play 10 notes at once with 10 fingers and uh, not take responsibility for intonation. So, uh, but I also must confess that I loved the sound of the piano. There was something that um, resonated within me, um, especially in the, the lower sections of the, of the piano. We didn't have a very good instrument at home, but there was something about the bass of the piano that uh, attracted me. And then, of course, putting the pedal down and creating these sort of, you know, overtones of resonance was uh, I, I remember that when I was about six years old, I thought, wow, this is really, this is interesting. Um, so sound was something that um, seemed like a, a sort of open door for me to express feelings that I couldn't necessarily express in words. And uh, then when my family t started taking me to concerts and I would hear, I'd sit in, in the front row um, and see these musicians great artists, you know, like Rubinstein and Serkin and Heifetz and Piatigorsky, Oistrach, Meta, uh, the, the, the way, the passion, the, it was like they were living an entire life in the piece of music that they were performing. I found that very, very inspiring. And it wasn't as if I decided, okay, I'm going to become a musician. It was just, it was, there was no other alternative really for me. It just, I knew when I was very young that this is what I was supposed to do. Um, I didn't know if I was going to become a pianist, but um, I certainly fell in love with, with great music, uh, especially the music of Beethoven and Brahms and Mozart and Bach. Those, those composers, um, I, I really identified with their music. Um, but I also love other great composers. I've experimented a little bit, um, mostly with improvisation, but um, you know, I, I certainly, I don't know if you would call jazz necessarily the music of Gershwin. I mean, Gershwin's music has jazz elements in it, um, but Gershwin, Bernstein, Balcom, Barber, all those composers have the influence of jazz in them. Um, I love jazz. I love, I mean, Art Tatum, Oscar Peterson, Bill Evans are some of my heroes as pianists, um, as well as, you know, Ella Fitzgerald and uh, uh, any number of great jazz singers. I mean, I, I, lo I love the music. Many of the young musicians that I have the privilege of working with um, were focused on the piano from a very, very young age. Uh, their parents, I think, were very, very supportive and um, helped them to find the best teachers at a very young age. I think that's probably one of the most important um, times in the life of a musician, those early years of getting to a, the right teacher, the right person that can inspire you and guide you, uh, that, that can be you know, also very dangerous. Because if you don't get the right teacher, you can be taught incorrect technique, um, not enough theory or ear training. So you know, it's, it's a kind of magical recipe that um, is, is important. You know, in, in some countries, they have schools, and we're starting to have that now in the United States, where when a young kid is identified with talent and focus, uh, 
There are special schools that they go to. Um, I know in Russia that's the case. And so they get very intensive, al almost like military school kind of training of technique, ear training, theory, uh, chamber music, going to opera, um, hearing great symphonic music, but also um, being exposed and, and, and studying great works of literature, art, uh, ballet. I, I think that's all part of what makes a great musician um, unique because you, you, the funny thing about being a pianist is that 99% of the repertoire, the great repertoire written for the piano by the great composers of the last few hundred years is inspired by things that have nothing to do with the piano. You know, from uh, literature, politics, uh, works of art, visual art, religion, uh, po religion poetry. Um, so I think for what, what, what I find happening now, which is, is, is fascinating, is that sometimes, you know, you can become too specialized in your field. And there's sort of a disconnect between, you know, working on a piece like uh, the Dante Sonata by Franz Liszt and not having read, you know, the literature that inspired that work, or uh, pictures and exhibition by Mussorgsky and not, you know, reading or being educated about the Hartmann exhi exhibit that inspired the work. Um, so what I try to do with uh, many of my students is I try to connect the dots and um, uh, get the larger picture so that there's a not only fundamental knowledge of the structure of the work, um, the character of the work, but what inspired the composer to write this composition. And it's something that I am constantly working on myself. Um, even when I know a piece for decades, I find that um, I revisit it, I restudy it, and it's, it's, a, it's a new outlook, you know. Um, that's certainly the case with all the great pieces of music in, and the Brahms Second Piano con Concerto for sure. Um, it's a piece I've played for a number of decades now, but it's, every time I play it, it's really like, you know, taking a different road or hike up the, uh, into the Alps and having a different view. And, and of course, depending on the orchestra you're playing with and the conductor you're collaborating with, that influences what I do. It's like chamber music on a very large scale. Sure. Well, I teach at the Thornton School of Music at the University of Southern California, and I've been there now almost 19 years. Um, and it's an incredible melting pot of talent, I mean, from all over the world. Um, I, I, it's very inspiring for me as a teacher to work with some of the most talented young pianists that um, are living in a completely different time than when I was a student at Juilliard. Uh, now with technology and the access to information, uh, performances, um, it's, it's, qu it's quite interesting. I still will underline that going to a live performance is so very different than seeing something, you know, uh, through the internet. Um, because, you know, 50% of a performance, at least from my perspective, is experiencing not only the music on stage, but sensing what the audience is, is experiencing, you know. And um, so I encourage my students to attend live performances. Not so much piano performances, but opera, symphony, go to the museums, things like that. Um, you know, the problem with being a pianist is that the repertoire is so demanding and time consuming that you sometimes think that you need to practice six, seven hours a day. But I'm a big fan of practicing three or four hours and then going to the museum or even studying a score away from your instrument so that you can conceptualize the music internally away from the instrument. And um, sometimes, you know, the, what is fascinating to me is how um, many people think of the piano or any instrument as an end in itself, but it's really not. It's a means to an end, a means to expressing the music. And um, part of that challenge, which I really work on with my students is uh, 
the fact that when you're a pianist, you're playing on different instruments every night. Um, and so you have to be very flexible and intuitive and have the technical know-how of how to adapt and adjust not only to the piano but to different acoustics. Every hall is different. Some are very resonant, some are very dry. Um, and that can affect how you listen. Um, the, the technique of listening in a big hall is something that I, I convey to my students because when I teach them, I teach them in a room and how they project in a room is going to be completely different than how they project in a big hall. You know, I always talk about you don't, you're not playing for the person in the first or second row. You have to project pianissimo, which is very, very soft, to the person sitting in the last row of the hall. And so, in a way, it's, it's sort of like method acting, you know, I mean, Stanislavski, I mean, how he influenced a whole generation of film actors, you know, who came out of the stage actor. And um, so it, it's really interesting. Another thing that's fascinating is many of the newer halls now built around the world seem to highlight the softer sounds. Like if you go into many of these modern halls, you can play pianissimo, I mean, and you, you can hear it anywhere in the hall. Whereas in the old days, I remember even, let's say, Carnegie Hall, which is one of the great halls, you always had to be conscious of projecting um, in, in a very different kind of way. Um, so I find that's fascinating. Maybe it's related to the way people listen to music through the digital age, I don't know. Um, but it definitely, and it's also affected how pianos are made now, which I tell my students, you know, when you play on a piano that's 50 years old, let's say, and hasn't had the change of hammers or um, hasn't been voiced to the modern standard, pianos now are, are brighter. Um, there's a very different texture in general, um, probably due to the fact that um, Again, it may be just the times we're living in where the intensity of listening to sound is different than it was 40 or 50 years ago. Um, the, in, the tuning of the orchestras now, and some in Europe, are at 444. And when I was growing up, it, it was 440. And in, I think in the United States, many of the orchestras are at 441. Some are even at 442. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating time of transition. In the old days, pianists that I used to hear like Horowitz and Rubinstein, um, their pianos were not 100% in tune. And I think that was intentional. I read that even Rachmaninoff used to tune certain notes in the bass slightly differently. Um, because when a piano is in perfect tune, um, there's a certain mechanical quality, I think, that can come across, where it's almost too clean. Maybe with some composers, maybe um, that can be a good thing, I don't know. But when you're playing, for example, Schumann or Brahms or Beethoven, even Chopin, when you play a chord, which I always try to equate with a choir, you know, the, the voicing of soprano, alto, tenor, and bass. When you voice a chord and all the notes are perfectly in tune, the vibration sometimes can be almost vertical rather than linear. And what I strive for in my teaching as well as my playing is to emulate the human voices. You know, my teacher used to say these are ten singers, not ten fingers. And so you have the soprano, alto, tenor, and bass section of your choir. And um, when a piano is perfectly in tune, especially in the middle register, it can not have the same kind of vibration as if some notes are just, I wouldn't say out of tune, but not vibrating identically. It, it, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, but of course, in the upper registers of the piano, you, you do want to have that, um, I think, some, somewhat more perfect kind of tuning. Um, especially when you're playing chamber music or with the singer or in this case with the concerto when you're dealing with the winds and the high registers you want your instrument to match 